All right, you guys, this is your next Q&A. Like I've been telling you guys all week, this is going to be a running Q&A. So if you have more questions, just keep submitting them. Like I always tell you guys, if I didn't get you on this one, I'll try to get you on the next one. So without further ado, let's get into it. So JT wants to know, could you talk about drugs in prison in the county jails in California? Some of the things you saw or were involved in. What was available prices and some of the big deals you saw go down? Also, the problems that arise, debts, fights, theft, etc. I think you could kick down some knowledge for these youngsters. Whether you're talking about the county jails, prisons, or any other type of facility where people are confined, drugs are always going to be prevalent. They're always available, and they're always at the root of all the chaos and turmoil. One of the first lessons I learned about prison for one of my older homeboys is to stay away from drugs and that this is one of the most common ways that people get caught up in there. Unfortunately, a lot of dudes that go to prison are already full-blown drug addicts before they even get there and end up getting caught up in this insidious trap anyway. If you look even deeper into this quandary, drugs are also one of the main reasons why groups like the MA, the NF, the AB, and the BGF fight over control over the main lines. And this has long been fodder for the war that's continued decade after decade. It's all about power, money, and control now. The criminal organization that gains full control over the main lines and maintains control over most of the system eats the best and lines its pockets the most. Money translates into power. And that's what these organizations use this money for. They not only establish power on the main lines, but then this money is used to invest in guns, more drugs, and other materials needed in order to establish more control on the streets. There's different elements of this problem, but one of the main reasons for a lot of the violence in prison is because of the drugs and who has the ability to control them. The presence of drugs in prison and the ability to make money from the sales of drugs is what motivates a lot of the violence, and this is what gives these criminal organizations an incentive to vie for control of the main lines. Like I said, there's a lot of different elements that come with this. Aside from what I've already covered, it also invites corruption and causes a lot of COs to cross that line and become corrupt. And the reason for this is because there's so much money involved. A $20 piece of heroin in prison sells for five or six times as much as it does on the streets. Cell phones can go for as much as 6,000. There's a lot of money involved. That's a lucrative profit and this is why these guys go to the extremes to get it in. I remember when I first started going to jail in San Francisco back in 1988. If I was sick from withdrawals, I couldn't wait to get processed so I could get to the jail in the back on the sixth floor where everything was at. On the line, which is the main line, they had trustees working that line and they basically had a run of the whole jail. Back then, they literally had everything that you were looking for. Heroin, cocaine, weed, crack, etc., etc. And at that time, they allowed you to keep up to $30 cash on you. So if you had the money, you could get whatever you needed or wanted in there. But this also invited all kinds of other problems. People were getting robbed, beat up, and jacked in there all the time. You had the regular gangs that were always selling dope, and they pretty much ran it. But occasionally, some dudes would come through that assumed that it was okay to sell their dope. And they would end up being the ones that would become the victims. I'm not going to lie. I robbed a couple dudes myself because back then they were always easy targets. So overall, drugs in prison and in the county jails brings on a multitude of problems. It invites violence, it creates corruption amongst correctional officers, it changes the whole environment, and it just creates a lot of other problems that wouldn't exist had they not been present. Respect All wants to know, David Eaton, Emma from SF, you said you knew him. How serious of a dude was David? And was he about his business? I spent a lot of time with David after he found Christ. And he was my big bro in Christ before he dropped out. I just want to confirm. I haven't heard this name in a long time. It brings up an interesting issue about my neighborhood when it comes to individuals like David Eaton. Like you said, he used to be an active MA member. And this has never been a secret. I never understood this. The homies from my hood knew who he ran with when he went to prison, but the majority of them never pushed those politics on the streets. It was almost like what you did in prison was your business, and the hood came first. It was like this before I even became part of my neighborhood. 
But David Eaton wasn't the only one. I remember there were others like Joey Nava, Glenn Escalette, Mike Eisen, and Danny Bruno. All these guys were from SFM, my neighborhood. And my older homies knew it, but nobody tripped off them. But I remember talking to a lot of the older homeboys from my neighborhood back in the early 80s. And I remember them telling me how there were different cars back then on the main lines. Sacramento, Stockton, Oakland, Hayward, Salinas, San Francisco, and a lot of other counties were divided up into their own individual cars. San Francisco always had one of the biggest cars, and this was something that I always used to hear about. At one point, I was one of the only guys from my neighborhood that started making an issue out of dudes like David Eaton. But after that, a lot of other homeboys started following suit. And whether it was on the street or in the county jails, whenever these guys started coming around, they always had issues. So Anthony O wants to know, what was your state of mind when you first touched down in Pelican Bay? Any specific feelings? Honestly, after having already been to other prisons like San Quentin and Susanville, I had already become acclimated to doing time and just being in the prison environment. So it wasn't like it was a huge shock for me. Even though I was young, I just looked at it as being part of the process. I'm not gonna lie either. Pelican Bay is a different kind of prison and this is something you can feel in the air when you get there. But for a 20 year old, I think I adjusted pretty fast. If there was anything about Pelican Bay that was intimidating to me, it was the fact that I knew that this is where all the seas were at. Up until that point, I had only heard about seas. I had never been around one. So this was a little intimidating because the few times that I had heard them spoken about, they were spoken about almost as if they were like mythical gods. The other thing I had to think about was the fact that Pelican Bay was considered a war zone at that time. The door policy hadn't been established yet. So the war was on and we had strict orders to torpedo out and engage with the ops if the doors were ever popped at the same time. So Alex True wants to know, what general made the final decision to hit you, boxer? If you want to call him a general, it was Antonio Chuko Guillen. During the time when Chuko was a self-pointed general and after him and Conejo basically hijacked their positions, DC was the only one who was holding the position of a general legitimately. But it was Chuko. He was aware of everything that had been happening with me. Dancing Bear was his neighbor in Pelican Bay Shoe in the short corridor sometime in or around 2006 before Dancing Bear was shipped back to the Santa Clara County Jail for his appeal. So when he came to the county jail where I had been for the last two years at that time, this is when Dancing Bear reached out to me to find out what was going on. I was housed in Little Max at the time and when he pulled up they housed him across the hall in South Max. I heard he was there as soon as he got there and likewise the other ends on the tier told him where I was at in Little Max. During shower program, he asked the tier officer if he could let him shower in Little Max, if he could let him shower over there so he could reach out to me. So that's when we first touched base. He came over there, and as soon as the CO walked away, he called out to me and said, Hey, B, is that you? I just barely found out you were back here. I just left Chuko in the bay, and we had no idea this is where you were at. This is when we first started dialoguing about everything that had happened, and I sent him all my paperwork. At that point, he submitted a report to Chuko advising him of everything that had happened. Chuko said to try to get me back on an active tier, that I was to be put on a freeze pending an investigation that would basically take place once I got back up to Pelican Bay after I fought my case. That's all I was asking for, so I was cool with that. So me and Dancing Bear succeeded in getting me back on an active tier, the tier where he was housed at in South Max. That's where I stayed for another 17 months. Then later, this is when Lancho pulled up and sent a misleading filter to Chuko, claiming he had paperwork in hand confirming I was all bad. But the important part he failed to mention to Chuko was that the paperwork he was referring to was my phone calls that were transcribed. Dirty Politics 101. Yeah, Chuko looked out for me in the beginning by getting me back on an active tier and giving me the benefit of the doubt. But then later on, he rushed to judgment and put that green light on me without looking into the paperwork that Lencho told him about. Had Lencho kept his nose out of my business, I'd be doing life right now, but I wouldn't be in bad standings. But depending on how you look at it, I guess he did me a huge favor pushing that personal agenda. 
So Raul Alvarez wants to know, in the eyes of the O, feds, is Mateo in good standing? As far as I know, yes he is. Mateo didn't do nothing but push the Fed agenda. If he's guilty of anything, it's for being loyal to them. As long as Mateo keeps to himself, doesn't allow himself to be placed on a PC, SNY yard, or a tier, or anything like that, I think he'll be okay. What's his infraction other than remaining loyal to the federal branch and not conforming to the foul agenda that Chuco, Conejo, and some of their minions were pushing? So Cultura Cafe wants to know, didn't know you were an RC for Salas at one point. How were you able to acquire that position back then? How was that experience? Yeah, Cultura Cafe. I was the RC in Salinas after my run out there in Ukiah in Mendocino County. In 2001, Ukiah Parole Supervisor Jerry Cardoza reached out to the Parole Regional Director that oversees parole in that entire region from Santa Rosa all the way up to the Oregon border and complained that they didn't want me back in Mendocino County anymore. As a result, the parole sent me to Monterey County. This is when I paroled out there and became the RC for the Salinas Regiment. When I finally made it out there, the fellas already had everything established and as far as I was concerned, nothing needed to be changed. No transfer of powers, no changing of leadership, the boat didn't need to be rocked. However, when I got out there, Juan Wino Gallegos was the assigned regimental commander and he was the one who insisted that I take over due solely to his lack of street experience and just based on his comfort level. I think a big part of it was the fact that I had just left him behind in San Quentin earlier that year and I was the RC in San Quentin. So for him, I think it had more to do with what he wasn't comfortable with. Because in my opinion, Wino was a sharp C and had everything under control. At any rate, I ended up staying out there for two years until I discharged in 2003. As far as how the experience was, honestly, I've always liked working together with the brothers from Salinas and I've always admired how serious a lot of them take their commitment to that lifestyle. The experience was good and I learned a lot working with them out there. San Jose was by far the most established regiment that I had ever functioned under and the things we were able to accomplish out there were unbelievable. But up until 2003, prior to getting sent out to San Jose, Salinas had been the most organized and well-ran regiment I had operated. So Cops and Criminals wants to know, it's obvious Lencho was weak. I don't understand how nobody in the Mesa saw this also. Do you have love for Diablo? If so, or not, why or why not? And three, if I have been in good standing for all my career and decided to no longer want to function at 50 years old, am I considered no good? As far as Lecho being weak or why leadership wasn't able to see it, Lecho has been the subject of criticism and scrutiny for years. It's not like the things he was doing went unnoticed or nobody wasn't aware of it. He just managed to slip through the cracks and do just enough to get himself by for years. Truth be told, there's a lot of C's like that. They managed to do just enough to get by and fly under the radar until everything eventually catches up to them. And that's what happened to Lencho. He's been ducking and dodging for years. He'd get out, stay out for a month or two, and then go back on a violation. Then he'd come back out and do the same shit again. But he had too much going on this last time. It all finally caught up to him. And that's what happened. As long as you stay out of jail or prison, and as long as you don't have any prior commitments, you should be good. In other words, as long as you're not a C or something like that. At 50, you should be focused on other things in life anyway. But if you put yourself back in a situation like jail or prison, then you might end up in a situation where you're either gonna have to make some tough choices or get back with the program. I hope you guys have enjoyed this Q&A. The second part of this should be coming out possibly Thursday, so be looking out for it. We'll give you guys a heads up before it drops, but we'll be going live tonight to update you on everything. Until then, as always, thank you guys for your continued support, for all your commentary, your constructive criticism, and for all the positive feedback you give us. This is what helps us grow 
and be better at what we do.